In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. These uh, two readings we have today are perfectly chosen for us, most especially as we're welcoming Mother Maria from Bethany in the Holy Land, who arrived Friday to our community and to the United States as she begins the month, like three long weeks, of sharing her life and ministry and raising money for her girls' school. You'll hear more about that at, at a happy hour. But it's, uh, you know, as I, I got the call Monday morning, hey, Mother Maria's coming, make your plans, you know? And it was also on Monday that I read these two readings. So I had in mind Mother Maria's visit, and then these two readings, which are just like perfect for us and for her coming here. Perfect for her trying to raise money for the girls' school. Perfect for us raising money to build a church on this property. And so it's a good thing to hear these things for us today. And probably a good thing for you to hear this mother before you set off for the next three weeks. So Matthew did an incredible job reading it, but I will read it again. Uh, brethren, he who sows sparingly, this is St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one of you must do as you've made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you may always have enough of everything. And may provide in abundance for every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who, uh, who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your resources and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every great way, for every way for great generosity, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I, it's, it's perfect. You know, it's actually the perfect like way to think about money every day. It's a perfect way to like live. Like this is it. You know, if I'm gonna give a little, I'm just gonna reap a little. If I'll go all in, the Lord, it'll just be bountiful harvest, you know? Not just money, like love and life. Like if I go in, if I push beyond, I'll be living in that place, that place that's pleasant, you know, that place that's green. You know, that place that's a little like paradise. That's where I'll live. We don't need to fear. And even with the war, wars in the world, the new one in Israel, the one lingering in Ukraine, we don't need to fear. We don't need to fear. So, Mother Maria is attempting to raise money for the school in Bethany. We're attempting to help you and to work soon, to work to build a church here. It's a bold goal, and frankly, it doesn't make really any earthly sense, and that's good. You know, good. It's good that it's not making earthly sense. That's better for us. Because it'll leave us in the hands of God. Like, it'll leave us relying on God. Like, and not just these two goals or something, but like anything. It's good that it's not obvious how we'll get there. That's better for us. It's way better. I mean, if you want to write a check for a few million bucks, we'll take it. But truly, we will. I'll have Clay get on that today. Uh, so, Rick, get out your check. No. Uh, but it's better, right? Whatever the Lord gives, we're just going to rely on it. No matter what it is, no matter how long it takes, or whatever happens, that's better for us. It's better. We'll have to work. And we'll definitely work. And he who wants to, if the Lord wants to, he'll multiply our resources. That's what the scripture says. He'll increase our harvest. And one of the best parts of that verse is, is the promise that we'll be enriched in every way for great generosity. Enriched. Like, some of us are working with the goal of becoming rich. Some of you are working with the goal of becoming rich. And it says, we'll be enriched in every way for great generosity. Like, if you're enriched, why? Why? Be more generous. It's incredible. So no matter what, or no matter how long it takes, we'll just keep trusting the Lord and probably should reread St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians as well. And I want to take a look at the gospel. The gospel today is about Jesus' crowd running into a funeral crowd. He's going into the city of Nain. Nain is the land of like pleasant 
like grasses, like it's, it's like lush. Nain means lush, like green, green pastures. This funeral procession is leaving that place. It's leaving the place of pleasantness. It's going out to bury a boy that just probably died today. Like he just died. They don't wait forever. Maybe it was last night. And they're taking him out to bury him. His mother is alone now. And they're heading out. This is it. Jesus is heading into this place of pleasantness, into this town. He's going into the green place. And the two crowds run into each other. In the Gospel of Luke, this boy is the first one that Jesus, is ra Jesus raises from the dead. In this Gospel. In other Gospels, it's Jairus' daughter that's raised. Then this boy, the widow named son, is raised. But in Luke's Gospel, the people did not know. Jesus, it said, went into the city of Nain. Many of the disciples and great crowd were with him. He drew near to the city gate, and behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow. A large crowd from the city was with her. It says a great crowd was with him, and a large crowd was with her. This wasn't like, you know, her and a few friends that were helping carry the boy out, and Jesus and 12 people, you know? That's not what it was. It was a great crowd with Jesus, and what did it say? A large crowd from the city with her. I mean, they probably had to be like, you know, I don't know how long the path, big the path was. It's like, um, you guys go, you know, like, there's all the big crowds, you know, kind of running into each other. When Jesus saw her, he has compassion on her and says, don't weep. He came and he touched the beer, which no one did. It would make him unclean. You did not grab that. And the bearer stood still, and Jesus said, Young man, I say to you, arise. No, like, questions about faith. No questions about this and that. And, like, no, like, who are you? What's your story? Or no, like, whispering in the ear from a disciple, This is a great woman. She's alone now. There was no, like, thing. He just sees a great crowd. A guy's going out. Stops, grabs a hold of the funeral beer, you know, with him on it, you know, wrapped up probably in a shroud or whatever. And he says, you know, looks around, don't weep, you're the mother, don't weep. Young man, get up. I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. <laughs> and Jesus gave in to his mother, and this is my, my line I love, fear seized them all. Two great crowds. Fear has seized them. Not like, and they were slightly afraid. Fear has seized them. And they glorified God. A great prophet has risen among us. God has visited his people. Young man, I say to you, arise. Great fear seizes them all. What is the fear that seized them? Like, what is it? I mean, God has come. That's got to be it, right? It's got to be that. God is like, in their midst, he's raised this dead man, and it just, again, in the Gospel of Luke, this had, nothing like this had happened yet. And they're looking at this, like, itinerant rabbi, you know, who didn't have, like, the proper papers from the synod, you know? He's got, like, scruffy fishermen with him. Sweaty, maybe. I don't know. Like... Dirty, maybe, like been on the trail a little bit, you know? <laughs> and fear seizes them all. They know this man, or they, they can tell this man they're looking at that his God has parents. They can tell this man that raised this guy from the dead is a man and God, you know? A belly button. The guy has a belly button. You know, the guy puts on pants and shoes. He has parents. He gets hungry. And he's God. You know, he played with other boys in the streets. His mom put hash marks on the wall as he grew. You know, he and his stepbrothers and friends went heel to heel to see who's taller. Like, he's a boy. 
He's a person. He's a human being. And he's God. Because no one raises someone from the dead. That's not happening. You know? Fear seizes them all. And I think part of it must absolutely be that death is not what we thought it was. It's like losing power by the minute. You know, death isn't the final word. This has to like, I mean, they're just, you know, their brains are just like malfunctioning. Like, death is the final word for sure, except maybe not anymore. And I don't know what that means, you know? And only the Messiah, who were expecting to be a certain way and look a certain way and act a certain way, only the Messiah could do this. This itinerant rabbi must be him. Fear seizes them all. The disciples will see these miracles again, hearing his teaching. They'll also very dramatically see this exact thing again when Jesus raises Jairus' daughter. And you know this story well because it's like a double story where Jesus is being taken to the synagogue ruler's house because his 13-year-old daughter had died, you know? And he gets stopped and a woman tells, her, tells him her long story about being sick Everybody's scared of her or whatever. She's sick, you know. And he, he says in one of the Gospels, it says he hears the whole story. You know, 13 years of being sick. 13 years of like doctor visits and blowing her money and being depressed about it and not being healed. And having hope and having the hope be dashed or whatever her story was. 13 years of it. It took a while to tell the story. And Jairus' daughter dies. And they come and say, don't bother him anymore. Your daughter's dead. He gets there and he says, why are you weeping? You know, they had like people crying and stuff, you know? Why are you weeping? He says to the mother, don't weep. And he says to these people, why are you even weeping? She's not even dead. She's asleep. And they laugh at him. And then, those, that's two. The third is the most dramatic. The third miracle like this where Jesus goes to his friends Mary and Martha, he heard that Lazarus was sick and was dying. He's in Jerusalem, a mere two miles away, just down the hill. And he hears that his friend is dying. He stays two more days, and he heads that way, finally, to Bethany. Mother Maria's school and monastery is built on the site, there's a marker there in a little, a little uh, chapel that in the road, they had put like a plaque, like they stone, you know, cut uh, a note to say it was on this, this spot where Mary, where Martha first goes out to see Jesus as he's coming in to Bethany to see Lazarus. Jesus came and he found Lazarus was already dead four days. Bethany is near Jerusalem. This is from the gospel. It's about two miles off and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. And while Mary sat in the house and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And even now, which is, this is incredible. This is the, actually, this is, this is the most the most made. She says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that we, whatever you ask of God, he'll answer. He'll give it. It's incredible. Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know he'll rise again on the last day. You know, the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die." yet shall live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. And we know that he weeps, he asks for the stone to be rolled away, and he calls his friend Lazarus out, and they unwrap him. Incredible. When we met Christ, and when we meet him, we find that he loves us. That he's merciful to us and that we're his beloved. 
He came to make us sons and daughters, which I preached on last Sunday. He came to make us heirs. You remember what St. Paul said to the Galatians, right? From when that time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so they might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of the son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So though God, so through God, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of the kingdom of God. In that epistle reading we had, it talked about, talked about uh, you know, being enriched for generosity. And this, it says, you become an heir of the kingdom. Like, an inheritance. Now, I'm going to guess most of us don't have an inheritance, like a big pile of money coming our way. Some of us might, for sure. Some of us do, I know. John just, John just raised his eyebrows. <laughs> My son. Yeah. Uh, we'll see about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and if you do, you're, you're rich. If you have an inheritance, you're just rich. And it says here we do. An inheritance in the kingdom. I mean, there's nothing better than that. So I also wonder about the fear that seized all them when they saw the widow of Nain's son raised from the dead. If it wasn't also not only this, like, thing about Jesus, you know, like, that he's a person, he's a man, and he's God, and they're trying to figure that out. But if it just, like, all the rumors were true, like, maybe it's all true, you know, what he does, what he says, who he is. Maybe it's just all true, you know? And our lives are gonna have to be like recalibrated to that. Like rethought through. Re, re, our goals have to be reweighed. What do I want? If all of it's true, what do I want? What do I want to do? If it's all true, then we can trust that we're safe in his death and resurrection. And it is all true. So for those of us who have that, not maybe fear has seized us, but maybe the fear of death has seized us, you know, the frailty of life has seized us, the brevity of life has seized us, and we're just watching like, my time might be up any minute kind of feeling. To live in this reality that we're safe in his death, we're safe in his life, we're safe in the resurrection. Give yourself to Christ. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? That's how St. Paul says it to the Romans. I always kind of wish it said, and his life. <laughs> or his death and the resurrection. But St. Paul, like, he, he got it down, right? Don't you know, all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. That's the good news. Because what did he do with death? He broke it. He filled it with himself. He filled death with himself. Death is not this other thing. Now it's full of him. St. Paul goes on, we were buried therefore with him by baptism. To death. That's how we get connected. Baptiz baptized into Christ. So, as, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might too walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. He has filled death with himself. And no one can take our death from us, so we'll face that. But we should not fear evil, evil tidings. For we're in his hands, and everything he does is for our salvation. Although sometimes it's hard to see. You know, let's pray, let's pray for the wars going on, that it's for, the, for our salvation, the salvation of others. I mean, I'm not saying the Lord started the war. He most certainly didn't. But he can turn something out of nothing. And he can make good from evil. So let's put our hands, put ourselves in the hands of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>